Hey, I was with uh, Bob Jones Jr. one time. He was talking about a great preacher named B.R. Lakin, and he said, he said, well, his wife wrote most of his sermons. And I said, is she still alive? Because if she is, I'd get her. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. I believe this is a great crowd. I believe it's the biggest corona crowd in the county. And uh, oh, I bet you any Sunday night we have the biggest crowd of any church anywhere. I sure appreciate Pastor Howell's leadership and really have encouraged. He's handled this situation so wisely. And you as a church have been so cooperative, and I'm encouraged to see that. Had not expected to be here. Supposed to be in Lancaster, California. And Brother Chapel, uh, they're limited out there to meetings of 250 or less. He said everything we're going to have you do is cancel. In fact, the college is canceled. And then next Sunday I was to be in Milford, Ohio. And uh, Ohio... They exempt churches, but they're encouraging you to have crowds of less than 100. And from there, I was to go to a big camp meeting in Georgia. And I'll know for sure tomorrow, but it looks like that's going to be canceled as well. So pray for my wife. She'll have me around a lot more than normal. Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse 23. I preached a series of sermons on this particular portion, these portions of Scripture years ago here. And then I put them all together and made one sermon that I would preach when I was out and about. So you've never heard this one sermon. You've probably heard some of the thoughts. I had another sermon, a couple that I'd written since I've been here last, but felt really impressed to the Lord to go this direction when pastor asked me to preach tonight so graciously gave me that opportunity. Uh, the trouble is, because I put that whole series together, it does take about an hour and a half. So, uh, yeah. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, when he's entered into a ship, his disciples, what are the next two words? Hey, there's a good idea. Disciples should follow Jesus. Behold, there rose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Mark chapter 4 has a similar account. I'm going to read three versions of this story, but they're all from your King James Bible, all right? Mark chapter 4, verse 35, the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. I'm always amused when I read those verses. Why are you so fearful? And they feared. They were slow learners. They feared exceedingly. And uh, said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the seas obey him? And in Luke chapter 8, if you wouldn't mind turning there, or flipping the buttons on your electronic device to get to that spot, verse 22, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, watch this question, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Father, I thank you for the wonderful privilege of preaching here at this tremendous church. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for his guidance in this time of crisis in our country. And Lord, help us to be a good testimony. There'll be many additional opportunities to give people the gospel because of this. And he's challenged us to be alert to them. Help us to do so. Thank you for the man that was saved this morning and is back tonight. And I pray you'd continue to do things like that in our midst. Guide me and empower me by your spirit. Help me to say that which would please you. 
And then I pray you'd bind the devil and his demons and keep that from distracting us and uh, not receiving the good seed of your perfect word. Make this a profitable time and lift up your name in our hearts. We'll thank you in Jesus' name for all that you do. Amen. The Jews were not seagoing people. They were land-loving people. But four of the Jews in this boat made their living on the Sea of Galilee. Andrew and Peter and James and John were fishermen. So when the Lord Jesus said, let's go over to the other side of the lake, it was no big deal. They had been there and done that. It was a journey they'd made and they had four experts with them in the boat. It wasn't very long and a terrible storm came up. The storms in that particular body of water are frequent and they can be fierce. It's surrounded by hills or mountains. Gullies have been etched into those hills by the wind and it whips down and causes a storm on the water. Only this was a really bad storm. This was so bad that even the expert sailors were frightened. I want you to think for a moment with me this morning and understand from paying careful attention, I'm supposed to do this sometimes too. (laughs) He's got a cane for my trip back up. The reason for the storm. People always look for reasons. Why would God allow something like COVID-19? Now, the answer to all my questions is, all those questions is sin. All started with Adam and Eve. Why did the storm come? Uh, One of my favorite Bible commentators, a man named John Phillips. John Phillips died as a member of Bobby Robertson's church. His funeral was there, a member of an independent Baptist church. And John Phillips pointed out that in the Gospel of Mark, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus rebuked the wind and spoke to the waves. That's interesting. He said the word rebuke is most often used in our New Testament to talk about rebuking evil spirits. You don't have to believe this, but it makes sense. John Phillips says he believes the storm was inspired by Satan. I don't know for sure that it was, but I know the devil likes to cause trouble. I know he's the accuser of the brethren. I know that he filled Ananias and Sapphira's heart to lie against the Holy Ghost. And I know that he likes to cause storms and trials in our life. Whether you believe that or not, you have to believe this reason. The second reason for the storm was not only was it, I think, inspired by Satan, but it was instructive for the saints. People say things like this sometimes, Pastor. They'll say, well, God was testing me to see whether or not I would do such and such. No, he wasn't. God already knew what you'd do. God has always known everything. He knows the end from the beginning. Dr. Hudson used to say, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? When the storm was over, Jesus didn't know one thing about the disciples that he hadn't known before. But the disciples knew a lot more about Jesus. Yeah, they, they had known that he could perform miracles. He'd done some of those pretty early in his ministry. They'd known maybe that he made blind people see and lame people walk again. They did not know that his power extended co- to controlling the wind and the waves. Our pastor preached a great sermon this morning from the book of Daniel. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar had had experience with God in the previous chapter. And he said, your God's a revealer of secrets. But he didn't know he was a quencher of fires. He had some more to learn about God. Can I tell you, you and I have some more to learn about God. Can I tell you that all the trials and troubles and all the trauma that we go through is designed to teach us some more about God. So the reason for the storm, it was, I think, inspired by Satan, was instructive for the saints. But think about the response to the storm. The disciples are scared. Why are you so fearful? They they were frightened. They said, Master, we perish. You ever get scared? If you want to get scared, just watch the television. Pull up some stuff on your phone. There's always some crisis somewhere and always somebody exploiting it and fear-mongering it and making it worse than it is. They're scared. It's a really bad storm. Uh, uh, the Lord Jesus is sleeping. Now, here's what's really interesting about that. When he went to sleep, nobody said anything. 
And we said, Lord, please stay awake. We're going to need your help. We're sailing across the water. Well, we might sink. There might be a storm come up here. You never know what happened. Lord, we need you. No, they didn't worry about it because they knew what they were doing. And they'd been there before on that same body of water in the same kind of ship. And they had that one fixed. And what they found out is they need Jesus all the time. The storms just remind us how much we need Jesus. They don't make us need him anymore. Lord, Jesus is sleeping. And it kind of looks to me like he did it on purpose. It says he was asleep in the hinder part of the ship on a pillow. Pastor, you took a nap this afternoon. Did you take it? On, did you use a pillow? I've had people sleep while I preach. Some of you here tonight. In fact, I have some regulars from when I was pastoring. I remember. I never say anything about it. I believe in the law of sowing and reaping. When I was in college, I worked a lot. Uh, one particular year, I worked night watch every other night from two, uh, uh, six a.m. Uh, two a.m. to six a.m. or ten a.m. to ten p.m. to two a.m. And then I worked in a mattress factory and all kinds of other things along the way. So I perfected the art of sleeping with my elbow on a hymn book and my chin on my fist in an upright position. So the law of sowing and reaping says I am owed people sleeping while I preach. I did hear about one pastor who had an old guy who went to sleep on purpose every Sunday. He was sick and tired of it. He said to his wife, next week I'm going to get him. He waited until the guy was sleeping real well, and he said, everybody who would like to go to heaven when you die, would you please raise your hand? Everybody raised their hands up to sleeping saint. And then he said, everybody wants to go to hell when you die. Would you please stand up? The old guy woke up, jumped up to his feet. Said, preacher, I don't know what it is we're voting on, but it looks like you and me the only ones for it. <laughs> but I never, never here or anywhere else had anybody come in, put a pillow down on the pew, and lay down to go to sleep. Jesus did it on purpose. By the way, he was sleeping in the ship, but he was still watching. Remember, the Lord Jesus became man in Bethlehem's manger, but he's always been God. And when he became man, he didn't stop being God. He said to Nicodemus, no man hath ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. He said, I'm in heaven right now, and I'm talking to you. He's God. He's everywhere. He's always alert. But the ship, the disciples are scared. The Lord Jesus is sleeping. The ship is safe. Anybody on a boat? Did you know it's natural for some water to be in your boat? You got a 16-foot aluminum boat with a 25-horse motor on it. You probably got a milk jug you cut out and left the handle on to scoop out water when it gets in the ship, in, in your boat. You got a bigger boat, it's designed so the water runs to the back and a bilge pump goes on and kicks out the water, kind of like a, a sump pump in your basement, same idea. But I don't know any boat that's designed to be full of water. The Bible says their ship was now full. The Bible says it was covered with the waves. But you know what? It did not sink. You know why it didn't sink? Because Jesus was in that boat. We used to sing that song, Master, the tempest is raging. The billows are drawing nigh. And we'd sing that part that says, No tempest can swallow the boat where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. Hey, be sure Jesus is in your boat. You'll be all right. Ship is safe. Reason for the storm, the response to the storm. Think about then a rebuke in the storm. There are two rebukes. Uh, there's a, a calming rebuke. The Lord Jesus says, peace, be still. And as quickly as the storm started, it stopped. Let me tell you about this crisis in our nation. Every other crisis in our nation, every crisis in your life, it won't last forever. When the news first started coming out, I said to Chrissy, well, honey, either we'll all die <laughs> or it's going to get better. That's all that's going to happen. 
We've been there and done that. It's, it's all right. And, and that's just natural response. That's just human involvement. Did you know all the trials and all of the troubles and all the tempests that you face can be ended by God as quickly as they started? So there's a calming rebuke and then there's a convicting rebuke. And the convicting rebuke has two parts. He convicts them about their fear, and he convicts them about their faith. He says to them, why are you so afraid? That's a good question. Think about what frightens you. Old age? Hey, I got news for you. You got two choices, get old or die. And even if you get old, you're still going to die. <laughs> Running out of money. Getting the coronavirus. Losing a loved one. We used to have a couple of members of this church. And, uh, and the lady always had a terrible fear her husband was going to leave her. We back in the days before cell phones, he was to pick her up at the mall up on Bay in Tittimawasi, and, and uh, they got confused about which door he was to get her. And he was 10 minutes late, and she was a basket case, bawling. She was sure he'd left her. 10 minutes late to pick her up at the mall. Most ladies count that as a blessing. <laughs> what scares you? No social security? Running out of health insurance? Somebody that you love being taken out of your life? Now, uh, the psalmist said, I will trust. I said one time, what time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. But he said again, I will trust and never be afraid. And it reminds you that God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the Lord Jesus said, why are you afraid? So think about what frightens you. So why? Well, Pastor, I might, I might get bad news from the doctor, but uh, I might find out that uh, this uh, illness is, uh, is malignant and not benign. I might find out that uh, I'm going to get really, really sick. Well, then what? Well, then I might die. Well, then what? What happens when you die? <laughs> Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. <laughs> hey, I got news for you. None of us getting out of this thing alive. <laughs> Unless Jesus comes back, everybody's going to die. Dr. John Rice founded the sword of the Lord, was a great Christian. And one day a guy came up and he stuck a gun in his stomach and he said, I'm going to blow your brains out. I don't think the guy was a biology major. I just felt impressed to have mercy on the videographers. And John Rice said, you can't scare me with heaven. Why are you so afraid? What scares you? Why? Why are you afraid of that? Uh, Monroe Parker preached here years ago, 1984, in the other building. We had a meeting with him and Bob Jones Jr. and Harold Seitler. Great meeting. Monroe Parker, years ago, was preaching in Kentucky, <clears throat> one of those places back in the hollers where the police didn't go. It was way before airplanes and that. He came on the train. The old pastor, 70-some years old, picked him up at the train station and said, hurry, hurry, get in the car. There's going to be trouble. He said the last evangelist that came here, uh, they shot him while he was in the pulpit. And the same bullet shot him, went through his body, and hit his wife at the piano and killed her too. So Dr. Parker hurried and got in the car. He went to the uh, church on a Saturday night for a prayer meeting, and they were praying like this, Oh, God, don't let Dr. Parker die. Oh, God, don't let Dr. Parker die. And he said, You could hear my fervent amens intermingled with their prayers. It was a rough meeting. Some tough guys with six guns on their hip came by and, and uh, folded their arms and stood at the back of the auditorium and kind of dared God to do anything. And one night they turned the lights off in the middle of the service. They beat up the old preacher. They broke his glasses. They stole his fountain pen. And Monroe Parker had had enough. He was a very strong man, played football. He would do a headstand, at, and then from a headstand he'd do push-ups. Go home and try that. We'll know if you did by the people have neck braces on on Wednesday. 
And Monroe Parker pushed the pulpit aside and he said, you bunch of cowards. Beating up an old man in the dark, break his glasses, steal his fountain pen. He said, everybody, he said, you guys go around with your six guns pointed at your heels. You better be careful. They might go off accidentally and blow your brains out. He didn't major in biology either. And then he said, everybody's praying, oh God, don't let Dr. Parker die. Oh God, don't let Dr. Parker die. He said, you can't kill me. I'm going to live as long as God does. Hey, so am I. If you're a child of God, so are you. I'm just here for a little while. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I don't think anybody here is going to die of the coronavirus. But I'll tell you what, if you do, you're going to be in a wonderful place forever and ever. And you won't regret one moment that you missed on earth. A rebuke about fear and a rebuke about faith. He said, how is it that you have no faith? And I like this. He said, where is your faith? Let's see. Who knows who made these pews? They are about uh, 38 years old. 19, no, no, about 28 years old. I take it back, 28 years old. Um, who knows how much they're rated for? That's why I saw people coming in tonight and they're looking underneath and making sure the pew looked good and trying to find what it was engineered for, right? Anybody do that? You just came in and plopped down in your seat. And some of you plop, plop pretty hard and you got a lot to plop. But nobody worried. I, I'm afraid the pew might not hold me up. Now, if it didn't hold you up, it'd be really embarrassing. You'd fall down and everybody, we'd help you. After we took your picture and put it on Instagram, we'd help you. We sat down. You had faith that that pew would hold you up, 28-year-old pew. Hmm. How many drove somewhere today? I mean, it came to an intersection and you had the green light. That happened to anybody? And I know what you did. You slowed down real carefully. You looked both ways just to make sure the people on the red light side were going to stop. Is that what you did? You didn't do that. You drove on through. Some of you mashed on the accelerator to try to get through before it turned red. You saw it turn yellow a little bit. Now, you had no idea who was in the cars on the streets coming either way. There could have been teenagers in those cars. You just drove on through. You had faith that complete strangers would stop and not run into you. Everybody's got faith. I probably shouldn't ask this. How many of you locked your car in the parking lot tonight? So few. So trusting. Now it's on live stream. You better lock them next week. <laughs> You have faith that nobody's going to come and try to make off with your car, the contents of your car, while you're gone. And, and the Lord Jesus says, look at, uh, where is your faith? You had it in your ability to cross the lake as long as the wind wasn't blowing. You had it on the salesman, the, 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 the shipment ability and sailing ability of Peter and Andrew and James and John as long as the storm wasn't worse even by their standards and their experiences. Where's your faith? When you got saved, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you trusted him and him alone to forgive your sin and give you eternal life in heaven. I got to lead a man to Christ yesterday. And there was Richard Harris. Pray for him. I'm hoping I can get him to come to church. And, and uh, he said, when I gave him, he said, no. He said, uh, uh, he said, I've been, well, I never got saved. He said, but I was baptized twice. He said, but I, I wouldn't even know how to ask God to forgive me. He said, I've, I've done a lot of bad things. He said, I've been really bad. He said, I've never killed anybody, but I've been really bad. So I gave him the gospel. I showed him our tract. I showed him the sinner's prayer there. I said, well, here's how you could ask God to save you, making sure he understood the gospel. And, and, and he looked at that prayer, and you know what he said? He said, I like that. <laughs> I like that too. I asked Jesus to save me, and I'm trusting him for my eternal destiny. I wonder if I could trust him to help me make it through the coronavirus, Amen. even though I just touched my face. 
Well, I wonder if I could trust him to supply my needs when things go haywire a little while and I have to work from home or maybe I get laid off because business is down. I wonder if I could trust him to help me rear my children. I wonder if I could trust him with my future. I wonder if I could trust him to do the things that are best in my life. Where is your faith? A few thoughts and I'm done. I think the last time I was here to preach, I told you my new motto is, if you can't be good, be short. Did you know there's probably some more storms ahead? What are they telling us about the virus? It'll get worse before it gets better. My personal sense is that they've taken rather dramatic steps to limit the spread, and it's going to be better sooner and not as bad because of that. But they're probably going to have some storms. It is impossible but that offenses should come. In the world you shall have tribulations. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Probably more storms ahead. Some of them probably be caused by the devil. See, he can, uh, he can cause you some trouble. He can send a storm. He can upset your sailing, but he can't sink your ship. Because if Jesus is in your ship, you'll survive storms that would sink anybody else. (laughs) You're in my hand. Nobody's going to pluck you. Jesus said out of my hand that I'm in the Father's hand. And nobody's going to pluck you out of his hand. You are safe and secure forever. And uh, I remind you this. You can trust Jesus even when it seems he's asleep. Have you ever felt that God ought to have done something before he did it? Have you ever felt like you're crying and you're praying and you're burdened and you're beseeching and nothing's happening and there's no answer and God didn't do anything? Have you ever felt like that? See, Jesus... Slept long enough so the disciples would know they really needed him. And way before the ship was in any danger of sinking because he was in it, he stopped the storm. I don't go to movies, you know that. I've never been to a movie. I read about a Superman movie years ago. Superman, what is he, more... Powerful than a locomotive and faster than a speeding bullet and able to leap tall buildings at a single bound, otherwise known as a church secretary. (laughs) In this movie, it said that Superman went down in this fire and he rescued this guy from a burning building. And so he's flying up way high and way fast and, and the Superman is way, way up above the ground. The man looks down and the houses look like they're made of Legos and the people look like ants and he gets scared. And Superman got upset. He said, hey, I didn't go all the way down there and pull you out of a burning building just to drop you on the way home. I wonder what God thinks when he sees us fret and worry instead of trusting and believing. I wonder if he says, why are you so afraid? Where is your faith? What are you trusting? How come you're not trusting in me? I, I wonder if he doesn't say, don't you know, I didn't send my son down there to bleed and die on the cross. I didn't lift you out of a miry clay and set your feet on a rock and establish your goings and put a new song in your mouth. I didn't indwell you by my spirit. I didn't erase all of your sins. I didn't create a mansion in heaven for you just to drop you on the way home. It's going to be all right. But Jesus says, don't fear. We fear because we have become too attached to stuff in this world we don't want to lose. And we have trouble with our faith because we choose to trust something or someone other than the Lord Jesus. Lord, would you help us? Thank you. That even if it seems you're asleep, we know you're absolutely in control.
Help us in these days of interruption, confusion, some trepidation. To realize we have something the world doesn't know anything about. We have you. Help us to love you and rely on you and trust in you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. I wonder if you're here this evening and you say, Brother Ouellette, I am God's child and heaven is my home and the Spirit of God has dealt with me. And I need to put in practice something I heard from his word tonight. Pray for me. You who say that, hold your hand up high. God bless you. God bless you. Father, help us to act based on what you've told us. We'll thank you in Jesus' name for what you do. Amen.